Today's gathering music is The Prelude in C, Opus 12, composed by Sergei Prokofiev, Russian composer, and performed by Sandra Hunt. Je vous souhaite le bienvenu à notre communauté, l'Église Unitarienne de Montréal. My name is Sandra Hunt, and I am the director of music and the pianist for this wonderful congregation. Welcome to the last Sunday service in December. This month, we are exploring the meaning of abundance today, a mixture of music and generous sharing of poetry from some of the poets in our congregation. John Paxman, Aldith Harrison, Mark Abley, and Susan Gray. I'd like to begin our service with two territorial acknowledgements by telling you briefly of the traditional lands of the First Nations where I and where my husband, our collaborating musician of the day, Gary Russell, grew up. Home for the first 21 years of my life was Edmonton on the North Saskatchewan River, a, a traditional gathering point, a trading hub, and home for many Indigenous peoples. Historically recorded activity includes the nations of Métis, Nehiyo, Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux, Inuit, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Soto and the Nitsitapi, Blackfoot, each with an abundance of stories and richness of culture. Every summer, my parents took us to Elk Island uh, Provincial Park to have a little game of golf. And the uh, public clubhouse there had a huge taxidermied head of a bison. It was very impressive. And uh, so I became interested in where this magnificent creature came from. Hunting bison in Alberta before the use of horses and firearms was no easy task. The main weapons First Nations people had were knowledge and courage. The profound knowledge of bison behavior gained over thousands of years of close contact with bison herds allowed indigenous peoples to be very successful at hunting these large animals. 
The balance of people and animals shifted in the mid to late 19th century, as bison were commercially hunted in large numbers. The once thundering herds were devastated, and as a result, food shortages broke out amongst the indigenous people. By 1890, the commercial demand for bison products had reduced the herds from 30 million to less than 1,000 animals. As their way of life and very survival was under threat, the people negotiated treaties with the Crown to protect their lands, including Treaty 6. These were mostly the Plains Cree, or uh, in the traditional name, the Nehiya. My husband Gary's great-great-grandmother was a member of the Musqueam Nation, the people of the river grass. Her ancestors had been present for several thousand years in what is today the unceded territory of Vancouver. Descendants of, descendant of the Coast Salish, the Musqueam, are a living culture with a complex network of organizations to promote and preserve their traditions, spiritual ways, and language. As Unitarian Universalists, we acknowledge that non-Indigenous institutions, including Unitarian Universalist churches, have had and continue to play a role in racism and colonialism that undermines Indigenous lives and communities. Our faith calls us not to shy away from these truths, but calls us to use our energy, resources, and privilege to build a beloved community which supports and celebrates the efforts of Indigenous peoples to build and rebuild strong communities for the future. For our prelude today, Gary Russell, cellist, will be performing the prelude of the third suite for solo cello in C major by Johannes Sebastian Bach. During the course of the service, he will continue with the other five movements, which include the Allemande, the Courant, the Sarabande, two Bourrées, and finally the Jig. <laughs> Thank you. 
we will now deepen into the spirit of community and the awareness of abundance of our lives shared together with the lighting of the chalice. Our chalice lighting text is by Orlanda Brunola. Flame, friend of our most ancient ancestors, we kindle you now to make you visible in time. Yet, in truth, you burn always in the unique worth of each person, in the beauty of this earth, in the imagination, in the turning of the heart to sorrow or to joy, in the call to hope, and in the call to justice. Burn bright before us. Burn bright within us. Hanukkah, Christmas 2021, blew in its chilly winds, warm the worried hearts, frazzled minds of the world. We see, feel, hope. Cold seasons of warm celebrations have pierced the heat and the cold, mixed the two, then warmed our souls. Lights pierce within, then release the frigid cold and fierce heat of fear and uncertainty, discombobulating precious souls. Sounds penetrating. Please burn away illnesses and fear. Sounds soothing, warmth within fire. Voices pour out sounds of duty, then like a flower, open, burst out. Share, burn away wretched contamination. This is the season of beginnings. Beauty, purity, even when the sun is light, the ground paler. The poppy coal nips when gratitude with love burns within. No awful concoction may penetrate the air or skin. Our next piece is Winterzeit or Winter Time from Album for the Young by Robert Schumann played by Sandra Hunt. Thank you. 
Good morning. I'd like to read two poems, Apt for the Season and the Time of Year, by the English writer Thomas Hardy. He was active in the last decades of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th, and he's best known for great novels like Jude the Obscure and Far From the Madding Crowd. But he thought of himself as a poet before all else. Hardy lived in the West Country of England, and he was deeply in tune with the natural rhythms of the countryside and the folk traditions of the past. Here is his poem, The Oxen, which grows out of an ancient story he was told as a boy, that at midnight on Christmas Eve, domestic animals would bow down in reverence, just as the cattle and sheep were said to have done in the stable where Jesus was born. It's a poem about the loss of childhood faith and the adult yearning to recapture it. The Oxen. Christmas Eve and 12 of the clock. Now they are all on their knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the embers in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen, nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. Yet I feel, if someone said on Christmas Eve, come, see the oxen kneel, in the lonely Barton by yonder coombe our childhood used to know, I should go with him in the gloom, hoping it might be so. Mm -hmm. As children, we liked our red carpeted front rooms best, when the Christmas tree tossed the air with the rich smell of pinions, when the curly brass chandelier was turned off, when, if you squinted your eyes during the day, the tree lights glowed through the branches like a scattered rainbow, when the unison noise from the tabernacle choir throng, or the nine carols and readings from King's College Chapel on Christmas Eve wound their way through the house, and when the dark rust-colored water in mom's cinnamon and clove spice pot slowly mulled its own thoughts on the kitchen stove and then misted them all the way to the antique soda fountain in the attic. It was then that the blue light wrapped its softest tones around the tinsel threads of a thousand icicles and reached for the Bethlehem star atop the green tree in the corner of the room. As children, we learned to take in as much of the blue light as we could rocking for hours, sometimes it seemed through the night, curled up in the white chair that looked directly into the deep of winter that shimmered there, the tree cast a slow blue and silver shade. 
We are sure we nurtured a child's hope that the hue of the blue light would somehow transform us too. Other times of the year, those rooms could have their own meaning, but not like when the blue light shone there, with its softest warmth all day and all night for more than the 12 days of Christmas. As children, the blue light just appeared from one day to the next each year, about the time of the candles, words, and songs of Advent. Now, at this age, we know that someone had to figure out where it would go. Get the wire, get the light, get the mount, get the circled blue glass, cobble it all together like an off rip gumption trap, get the stepladder, and, with a set of most curious tools, set the mount to the wall, just a little above the cracked white molding that framed the sliding doors above the red shag rug of the two front rooms. It hugged there all season, as if by magic. We were blue light blessed. As adults, now at a distance, we know that the blue light does not shine where and when everyone is for themselves. Like the tall hundred year pine that blew down in our front yards, the blue light will not stand or shine where there is too much to show, not enough root. Last year, our father took the blue light with him to Trinidad to flood the sun-whitened wall of the orchid garden beneath the oval windows on the east side of the Lepoy house in the sharp green northern hills, a long way and a long time from the children in Utah. It is now our turn to put up the blue light wherever we are. Merry Christmas, Joyeux Noel, Feliz Navidad. Sandra Hunt will now perform an arrangement of O Tannenbaum, O Christmas Tree, by Scott Ranney. I'd like to share with you a poem that Susan Gray, a member of our congregation, wrote just this week. 
It's called crisis mass. At primary school, one cookie cutter fit all. All hymns led to a special boy in swaddling clothes, delivered on a haystack while the animals prayed. I remember the thrill of a great tree delivered on a wooden sleigh from the lot next to the Presbyterian church. I became a brownie in that church, passable for a number of years. But one year as a girl guide was more than enough. There wasn't much spiritual alternative. My family avoided the Jewish community like the plague. As Jews, we take to guilt as naturally as a newborn to the nipple. As a self-hating Jew, that compounds to celebrate his birth is to deny our own. All this through the meat grinder of corporate capitalism, where holidays are spewed out at regular intervals to keep store shelves stacked with costume jewelry and decorations. One Christmas, our cat toppled the fully decorated tree. I guess she hadn't prayed enough. Hi, my name is Shoshana Green. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a member of this congregation. Our community is entirely supported by the generosity of its members and friends. And as part of our commitment to take action in the world, we also share our plate. Each month, we invite you to donate as you're able, either online or through our collection baskets outside the sanctuary, to a local nonprofit whose values and mission align with ours. And this month, half of the loose cash in our collection baskets will be given to Stella, an organization by and for female identified sex workers in Montreal. For more than 25 years, Stella's mission has been to improve the working conditions and quality of life of sex workers and to educate the general public about sex work. They offer legal information and medical and social support. They fight discrimination and promote community and solidarity, both among sex workers and with their allies. They publish newsletters and informational material for sex workers and for the general public and they work against discrimination and criminalization. To support their work, please go to shaystella.org or place a donation in a basket as you leave the sanctuary. And of course, you can support the Unitarian Church of Montreal on our website, ucmtl.ca, or with a donation in a basket. Thank you. Frost fairies, wet, cool, cold, clear, high, attract 
frayed grass that cling trust. Tree shrubs warmed by white dust in blue haze where mist fairies join hands touching feet around all shapes of trees. Warmth is removed from touch of frost that brings blush and carries glow. White lights glitter waves as airplanes streak past clouds of crystal gleams. There are fairies we are apt to destroy by attacking their homeland, decimating the skies. What shows will we see flying past in minus degrees? How can we compare the warmth of inside when frost fairies we find we are compelled to deride? Frost will be petrol to maples, so to flow. Sure candy maitlin takes over from tired frost in spring. If white sprinkles south, tropics smell cold as undesired fate calls supine sun to keep date, prepare for warm, humid, rainy state. Give birth to world of deities, sprites, be keen. Keep winter north, south, God warmth in between. Cold inhabitants play in brown fields of white. Warmth occupy latitudes 23 and a half degrees on both sides. Sandra Hunt will now perform Changes by Alexina Louis, a Canadian composer. I'll now read a second poem by Thomas Hardy, this one written on December 31st, 1900, the final day of the 19th century. Then, as now, there was much in the state of the world to worry about. What saves Hardy from despair is the song of a fearless bird, a small emblem of joy. In the next few weeks, now that the solstice has passed and light is returning to the sky, you should be able to hear cardinals beginning to sing in the streets and parks of Montreal. I hope you find the same kind of meaning in their song that Hardy found in late December, 1900. The Darkling Thrush I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre grey, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlent, his crypt the cloudy canopy, 
the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twinks overhead, in a full-hearted even song of joy illimited, an aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled through his happy good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. I chose to read to you today from the poetry of Rilke, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, and translated by Edward Snow, a poem called The Carousel, Luxembourg Gardens. With a canopy and its shadow, it turns for a short while, this little herd of many colored horses, all from the land that lingers long, then disappears. Some, it's true, are hitched to carriages, yet all have courage in their faces. An angry red lion goes with them, and now and then a white elephant. Even a stag is there as in the woods, except he wears a saddle, and on top of it a little blue girl sits all buckled in. 
and on the lion rides a boy in white, who holds on tightly with his small, hot hand, while the lion bears teeth and tongue, and now and then a white elephant. And on the horses they come skimming past, girls in bright dresses also, almost too old, already for the sleeping of horses. In the midst of the lunge they look up, off, over here. And now and then a white elephant. And it goes on and hurries to be over and only circles and turns and has no goal. A red, a green, a gray coming past, a little scarcely formed profile. And from time to time, a smile, turned this way, elated and starry-eyed as it expands itself on this blind, breathless play. <laughs> Thomas Hardy found hope and solace in the song of a bird, and I was once inspired to write a poem by the memory of birds. Thrushes live all year round in England, where the winters are generally so mild that many species of birds don't need to migrate, whereas here in Canada only a modest number of birds remain through the entire year. In our winters there are no insects on the wing for barn swallows, tree swallows, or purple martins to eat. They arrive here in early May and they leave in August and it was thinking about their absence through the cold, dark times of the year that led me to write the following poem. One Swallow Fearing and skittering a wing's breadth above grass and cement, indifferent to risk, gone before an eye can follow. Are the moths and mosquitoes really so quick you need to put on this silk du soleil, forked tail? Will of the wisp display? Look at the managerial starlings pecking away beneath you. Don't they make you a little envious of land? No. Breath of sky. It's inconceivable you should lurk in mud's element. Blue-black wanderer. Bird in no hand. Dodger. Freelancer. Showman. Corkscrew of air. On your swiveling travels. Never lose faith in your act. When you hurtle south for a winter, 
The sky grows pale-faced and stormy without your insouciant whippersnap flare. The days hunker down in your absence, needled no longer, stolid as work. Your flight was their thread. Now you're dangling over Guyana, still chasing lunch with that cool, improbable artlessness. We missed you. You always missed us. Our service has come to an end, and I will invite you to stay online for the coffee hour chat on Zoom. But now I will read the words of Maddie Sifantus to extin before extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again.